Ladies and gentlemen, I have a very special guest and a, a new a type of guest to the PlayStation Blogcast today. I am joined by Kari Walgren, actor extraordinaire. Kari, thank you so much for joining me through the power of the telephone. Oh, I love it. Telephone. <laughs> <laughs> the only <laughs> the only way some of our interviews get done. <laughs> um, That's so, right. I get all nervous when there's like an interview with with the new technology because I'm I'm such an analog girl in a digital world. Yeah, that I love that. That should be the name of your next hit single. Right. It should. Right. So so you've done so much voiceover work in a lot of different fields, and you know, as we were just talking about, I I did a little bit of research because I wanted to pick your brain about some stuff, but. Let's just do a, at least start with the most recent work that you've done that I, I think a lot of people will be interested in, which is lending some voice work to Final Fantasy XV, which is still coming. It's on the road. And, yeah. And I know that you're, you're limited in what you can say, but do you want to share maybe a little bit of, uh, of some of your work there? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this game coming out. And I think it's coming out now in November. It was supposed to come out this month, but it got bumped a little bit to make the, the quality of the game even better, which I think is exciting. But uh, I'm, I'm playing Aranea Highwind in uh, Final Fantasy XV, uh, and she's a, a professional mercenary fighter, and uh, she's kind of a, a captain of this troop. And because, you know, people can hire her, her loyalties are kind of for, for sale as well. So Ooh. she's kind of a a very exciting, ambiguous character in the game as far as whether or not she is for or against the player. Oh, most and excellent. That's, yeah. It's, it, those are always the most fun for me, too. Um, I, I love playing villains and, and questionable questionable characters. They're, they're, they're always a little bit more juicy than just the straight-up heroes. Oh, absolutely. I can imagine. <laughs> And, and do you feel like, I, I don't know if, if this is, you know, please share your, your feelings on this, but uh, when it comes to voicing an, a character in something that's just been so long awaited and so, so anxiously anticipated, does that, do you feel like that adds added pressure to, to your performance or is that something that you can kind of shed and abandon when you, when you enter into the sound booth? You know, that's a great question. Um, sometimes the projects are so top secret that we won't even know what we're working on Ooh, in the studio. It'll, it'll just be under some code name. So you're working on, you know, Project Purple. Uh, <laughs> That's my favorite game. No joke. Yeah, it's my favorite. Um, <laughs> and actually, sometimes when you find out much later in the process what it is that you actually were working on, it's a relief to me that I didn't know because... I didn't have that added pressure of, oh, my gosh, this could be huge or, you know, this I need to make sure that the fans like this or it takes some of the pressure off mm. when you don't know for sure what you're what you're working on. You can kind of just um, go into the studio and create the character as you see it on the page. Interesting. Um, but then also sometimes. I like being able to do research beforehand. I, I've played, um, for example, I've played Emma Frost in the Wolverine and the X-Men cartoon and also in one or two of the video games. And I read a lot of the graphic novels and comic books and things before going in to record her. Um, and and that's always fun, too, because then you kind of have a, a much more fleshed-out idea of, of who that character is before you start tackling the project so absolutely i don't know you kind of you kind of in the voiceover world you kind of have to go in and and make the best of what you're given because sometimes it's not a lot and sometimes you can do a little bit more uh research beforehand a little detective work here and there I, so I, I love how you so casually say, oh, and then I voiced, you know, Emma for like one or two games. And, and that kind of makes me think in your huge library of work, to me, I, I almost am exhausted thinking about those hours and all that time and all that energy and that emotion <laughs> that you're putting into it. How, how do you kind of stay refreshed and how you reinvigorate not only your voice, but the emotion that you're putting into it with every role? Coffee. A lot. <laughs> Such a simple coffee. answer. <laughs> I was expecting um, I, something artistic, but it's really just chemical. 
I, I literally, I wish I could, um, as far as just the hours in the studio, I don't know about anybody else, but I hit those mid-afternoon slumps, you know, and <laughs> and I've tried to do it in a more like healthy, organic, holistic way or something, and I just find that I perform the best when I'm really caffeinated. Perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> and aside from that, I mean... You know, hopefully, if you're lucky, you're working with a great director and a cool engineer and, and uh, you know, a couple of, of clients that are really excited about the project because that enthusiasm, you catch it, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and one of the most fun things, especially with games, is uh, when you go in to your recording session and they say, here, let us show you some of the initial artwork or here let us show you a trailer for the game or a teaser of some of the in-game fighting and things and when you actually get to see little snippets of what is going to come together down the road it gets you really excited to be part of it yeah because you get to see the bigger picture of what you're working towards right and that can be hard sometimes especially with video games because most of the time you record those by yourself so it's just kind of like one puzzle piece in a big puzzle. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to think, oh, I wonder what this is all going to look like when it all comes together. So any little glimpses that you get of the big picture and the big puzzle uh, is very exciting. That's what I was going to ask you, actually, in terms of Final Fantasy XV. As you said, it was such it's such a closely guarded project, um, a little less now since they're marketing it, but... Uh, did were you able to interact with your fellow actors at all, or did a lot of it come down to solo work in the studio? Uh, it was all solo work oh, wow. for me. Uh, Holy smokes! And again, yeah, and again, this was one of the ones where it was under a code name, and I really didn't know until one of the last couple of sessions what it was that I was working on. So that's so uh, amazing! Oh my goodness, I couldn't even yeah. imagine not having any context. <laughs> it's uh. That's that's another reason that voiceover directors, I have to just send up huge props for good directors because they have to provide so much context and and have such an idea of the big picture to help us out. Um, so when you get in there with somebody really, really good, they just kind of guide you through it. And, and it's almost like you're experiencing it as you go along, it's kind of cool. Absolutely. So we have some great directors on this project. Good. Shout out to all the director folk out there. Yeah. They, they get Farley, out. Kirk Stolten. <laughs> um, so let's, let's pivot a little bit because there's something I, I 100% need to ask you, and it's near and dear to my heart. I didn't warn you I would ask you this. I think it's fine, though. Ah! <laughs> um, I, I believe you voiced Haruko from Furry Curry or FLCL, which I, I, that's like a long-standing favorite anime of mine. So I, that was one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you. Um, I know that was a little bit ago. That was uh, a couple minutes ago. Uh, but I don't know. What are some, some memories or anecdotes <laughs> from that recording process? Because that character is completely bizarre. Well, I'll tell you, that was my first voiceover role in Los Angeles. What? Are you uh, serious? It, I am not even kidding you. Not only was it my first anime role, but it was my first voiceover role in L.A. after I moved here. That's like playing uh, on hard mode right out of the gate. That is, uh, that's a, a, a tall order. It really was. And, and uh, it was like getting thrown into the deep end of the pool because I just saw this ad in, a, in an actor's, it was actually in print at that time. Oh Kids, gosh. yes, it was in print. <laughs> it actually held the the uh, audition notices in your hands. Um, and so I went in and I auditioned for this project and they they said, well, we want to call you back for another audition. We're going to send you home with a VHS tape. <laughs> oh, and uh, I know, I know, kids. There were actually these things called <laughs> VHS tapes. <laughs> and they said, it's all going to be in a foreign language. Don't worry about that. We just want you to watch it and we want you to kind of get a sense of, of the attitude and sound of this character. And um, so I'm, I'm listening to it and I'm watching it and I have no idea, you know, what's being said. Uh, so I go into the callback and I just kind of 
do my best to recreate her sound and and what was happening. And it was the scene um, where she first appears on the Vespa, and she's mm-hmm. doing the whole lunch time. And um, they said, you know, we really like you. We want to hire you for this project. Have you had any experience dubbing before? And I said, no, but I'd, I'd, I'd be really, really willing to learn. You know, I said, if you could take a chance on me, give me a shot. I, I will work as hard as I can to make, make this work. Yeah. So not only was I hired for this, this show, and I, I didn't know much about anime. I'd watched a little bit, um, but, you know, I, I didn't know a ton about anime, and I had never dubbed anything into English before. And all of the clients from Japan and the creator of the original FLCL show were all there in the room. <laughs> no uh, pressure. So it was a very high pressure <laughs> situation. <laughs> Uh, but the amazing thing, and I think the thing that really saved it, was that they were so committed to doing a high-quality dub of that show that they took a lot of time. Um, you know, it was only like six episodes, and they took maybe a couple of months to record it, which is unheard of. I mean, usually you, you turn over an anime so fast with the recording, uh, but they took a lot of time to really get it to where they were happy with it. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was my first job, and it's still one of the most popular things that people will ask me about. So, holy cow, you know, I feel so lucky that that happened. (laughs) And sorry that I'm making you dredge up all these old memories again. (laughs) No, no, I'm I'm so honored, you know, that the fact that it's uh, it's still entertaining people. And the cool thing is that when I go in and I work on a cartoon show, um, you know, there there have been original animation cartoon shows that I've gone in, and there will be one of the guys wearing an FLCL T-shirt that has no idea that I it's you. <laughs> did auto show. And so I'll say, hey, oh, my gosh, did you like that show? I, You know, I kind of worked on it and stuff. And they flip out, and they're like, this inspired me to become an animator, or this inspired me to become a writer for cartoons. So, you know, that's that's something that means a lot when you've done something that, mean something to people it's pretty yeah, cool 100 percent. that's amazing well thank you for sharing that i know it's uh it's not video game related but i think pretty interesting yeah uh, <laughs> let's let's pivot one more time and then we can get back to more uh, traditional video game and animation stuff but i i told you i kind of wanted to just hear about some of your experiences working in shakespeare because like that's what i i kind of loved and studied when i was younger and looks like you had done some work with the kansas city shakespeare festival and I think King Lear is that one of the ones you were yeah. in. Yes, that was that was one of the uh, shows that I did, and and I really miss it. I actually, um, I hope, fingers crossed, that one day I, I get a chance to do a little bit more Shakespeare because, I mean, there's just nothing like it, and uh, stage work. I, I I just it has such a special place in my heart, and Shakespeare especially. Yeah. Um, is is so powerful and actually i i can tie that back a little bit to video game work because i did i know this is a little little side story but i did final fantasy 12 and i played ash and wait really oh actually i'm so sorry i don't think i knew that really I did. Are, I... You, are you sure, Kari? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, I make it a point to only lie once in an interview. So. <laughs> oh, you got to find the lie in this one. Um, <laughs> so wait, wait. Now hold on a second. I that this is a part of my that my research missed. So so you played Ash, one of the leads in Final Fantasy twelve. Um, I did. And and I did. very. I in a very Shakespearean uh, style and tone, I think, to the to the writing and to the to the performances there. Exactly, um, very much so. I felt the same way. And the thing that happened during the recording of that, we had one session. Uh, it was our first session of recording Ash, and after we finished that session, I started a Shakespeare class. I was signed up for it, you know, and it just started after after the first day of recording for the video game. So I started taking my Shakespeare class, and then I went in for my next session in Final Fantasy XII, and, 
and they said, I don't know what it is that, that you're doing, but there's something that is just com- really resonating and working so much better for this character in this session. Can we go back and re-record everything that you did in the first session? Oh, my gosh. And I, I said, sure, but it was because of the Shakespeare class. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of near and dear to my heart, you know, when people say, oh, can you really use a theater degree in, in voiceover work? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, and of, course. of course. And Shakespeare, I feel, is so relevant, especially for a lot of the, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it, but just kind of the Middle Earth type games or, or you know. Like high fantasy and, and stuff like that. High fantasy, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that was a, spe- a specific example where kind of my Shakespeare background came in to, to really help create a character. And you, you, had list, you have listed on your resume, ma'am, that, uh, that you, <laughs> uh, among the accents that you do, I, I mean, I saw British as one of the dialects listed. And I, I, did, do you, did you ever have to, like, train with dialect coaches? Or is that something you study just through listening and observing? Uh, I also, um, well, I got a theater degree at the University of Kansas, Rock Chalk. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I did take some dialects classes there, cool. which ended up being extremely helpful. I mean, that was another case where, you know, school and, and university isn't for everybody, but for me, I took some skills away from that that really, really ended up helping me down the line in my voiceover career. And those uh, those dialects classes were just crazy helpful. And I still have, um, you know, I started out, with all of my dialects things on cassette tape and then the professor upgraded to CDs and now <laughs> there are some really great websites just online with lots of sound samples so whenever i have kind of an accent that i'm not as comfortable with or or don't know as well or just want to refresh i'll go back and still listen to sound samples just to kind of try to get in the mode for it i love it what's wait real quick what is the hardest accent you feel to for you and your repertoire to do <laughs> my crappiest accent is my australian accent oh, it's awful really why i for some reason it just always morphs into something else <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, best, <laughs> the best australian accents that i ever do are for characters where they say this character has a crappy, over-the-top Australian accent. I'm like, done! Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> it was a role I was born for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm yeah. a natural. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, I am I'm, I'm I, I don't want to keep you for too long, so b- before we start to, to wrap up, I have to, I have to ask you what, what voices you've done for Phineas and Ferb, which is one of my wife's favorite shows, and I just got to know. Oh. Phineas and Ferb, I was uh, Jeremy's little sister, little Susie. Oh, my gosh. Adorbs. I got to tell her. She's going to flip out. It was so much fun, and, and that was great because she was only supposed to be in this one episode, and then apparently, apparently they kind of liked her, so they kept bringing her back and in some other episodes. I so been, much fun. I would have been tripped out if you were like, oh, yeah, I, I play Perry the Platypus, and, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> I did not expect that one. But uh, Sadly, okay, no. a, that sounds good. Um, so what would you say, uh, looking back on a lot of your work, um, do you feel like there has been a particular role that has really stuck with you and informed a lot of your work um, moving forward in your career? Wow, that's, that's a really good question. Um, well, I think, I think Haruko yeah. was a big one. Um, just because it was my first one, and it was such a jumping-off point for so many other anime projects and so many other video game projects. Um, And, you know, like I said, there are still American writers and animators that, that use that as an inspiration for what they're doing. So I do think that a lot of it, ties back to that. Um, and 
I don't know. I think the first, uh, I think the first series regular, like on a Disney show that I had was mm. Super Robot Monkey Team Hyper Force Go. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the time I learned how to say the name, like it had gotten canceled. So it was oh. very sad. <laughs> um, but the fun thing about that was that it was, you know, uh, an American creator that was very influenced by anime. And so it had, um, I think, all of the best elements of, uh, you know, East and West. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the uh, influences of, of anime and original animation. Uh, and so I also felt like that was a great role to sort of, jump into a lot more of the other things that I was doing, too, because it was an action-adventure cartoon, you know, the buddy superheroes kind of thing, the plucky young character, which I've gone on to play a lot. So, hmm. so yeah, I would say that would be the other character that kind of jumps out at me as an early one that kind of shaped a lot of things. Wonderful. Kari, I could probably talk to you for the next two hours and pick your brain on all this stuff, but I'm going to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for spending time and chatting with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such a pleasure, and I, I hope that uh, everybody out there will just kind of keep in touch with me. You guys can find me on uh, Twitter, at Kari Waldron, or Instagram, at Kari underscore Waldron, uh, or Facebook. So keep in touch. Perfect. Thank you, Kari. Great. Thanks a lot.